Face Beneath the Oil Extract read by the author I'm living in a nightmare and I can't get out of it. Chris Watts, August fourteenth, twenty eighteen. Some people choose to see the ugliness in this world. I choose to see the beauty. Dolores Abernathy, Westworld Chapter 1 Final Steps I came home and walked in the house and nothing just vanished. Chris Watts to Denver 7 He's awake. His black eyes watch her enter remotely via the doorbell camera. Nicole leans forward, catching a glimpse of Shanann's fingers twinkling at her from inside. Now that she's inside, there's no need to see her, no need to spy. He can hear her. He blinks. As Nicole's battered white Mitsubishi withdraws, he puts down his phone and carefully adjusts his gloves. The front door clicks shut. He blinks, listening. Car lights swoop through the front windows. Then the interior of the house is cast into darkness once more. What's she doing? Thinking of the family and not wanting to wake anyone, Shanann leaves the lights off. Good girl. It's dark inside, a sort of dishwasher grey, but light enough to see. Shanann pauses at the door, wondering momentarily where Dita is. What's she doing? She kicks off her shoes, then, walking bare feet, w pulls at the handle of her flame orange suitcase. He can hear the plastic wheels turning, rolling along the foyer floor. Time slows. Each revolution of those wheels brings her closer to him and the cruel fate he has in store for her. He can't wait. As the sound comes closer, his heart quickens as only a predator's can before striking its unsuspecting prey. Crouching behind the pillar, he has a split second to have second thoughts, but instead of hesitation there's excitement, even anticipation. It'll be over soon. It's almost over. She's right here. And then the signal. As the wheels reach the bottom of the stairs, as Shanann lifts the suitcase onto the carpet, he knows exactly where she is. Her one hand isn't free. It's locked around the handle of the suitcase. Her back is bent slightly. And facing the stairs, she has her back to the dining room, but more importantly, to him. It's now or never. He pulls the mask down over his chin and, thus transformed, advances on her. A stealthy shadow in a dark house, the carpet silencing his quick steps. He uses Bellow's pillow cover, twirled into a makeshift lasso and seeded with her DNA, and in a flash flips it over her head. Shanann doesn't have a chance to cry out. For a second she thinks it's a game, except the pressure is brutal, unrelenting. Her fingers become claws, groping, snatching at his forearms, mixing with her daughter's DNA. The demon behind her is resolute. She is resolute. Bastard! The terrible pressure on her neck, more than that of, ox of oxygen, causes her to... to... She reaches back in a final frantic effort to save herself, to save... Her finger catches its target on his neck. She hears a grunt. Fucking bitch! He, s he pulls his hair back. And as she bounces and flails like a bird caught in a fishing net and starting to drown, slowly she begins falling forward. The noose tightens even more. 
Her eyes bulge alongside bulging veins in her temples. She coughs, she splatters, but for the most part, it's a silent fight for her life by her, a, s a fight against her life by him. He's surprised by how much spunk she has, how desperately she wants to live. Somehow this warms and validates him. Yes, he desperately wants to live his best life too, and she's been spoiling his game for too long. As her lungs burn and bleed for air, her knees finally buckle under her. She loses the contest to keep herself upright. He pushes her down now, down against the stairs. Sensing the hard part of the contest is over, he manages a quick glance around him, even though he's checked the windows from this spot earlier. Yes, she's out of sight here on the stairway. He's digging his knee into the small of her back, squashing the baby against the step, crushing her chest. It feels good to be on top of her like this. It feels good that she's unable to say anything to him, and soon he'll be the one doing all the talking. She wants to cry out, but a snake has crawled down her throat and into her chest. Like a worm about to be speared on a fisherman's hook, she rises ineffectually against his bulging grip. Her movements now are so slow and deadened, they appear lazy as the last of her life drains out of her. In a dim recess, a part of her separates from her body and sits apart from all the pain. It's so late and he's been too quick, just too much of a surprise, catching her at a weariest moment. Her lungs scream, her heart explodes and melts at the same time. Her lips and tongue chew and taste the air, but can't swallow it. Images start to flash somewhere in her mind. Feelings of regret and anger and heartache bubble to the surface of her grey matter. Thriven. The last thing Shanann sees is the carpeted staircase as it rises up through the dark house. A far-off bump and then a final fading glimpse of is it the wheels of the bright orange suitcase she can feel her body and mind letting go of the world despite her doing all she can to hold on now he moves around her a crafty fox he adjusts his grip on the pillow cover and jerks, exerting interminable force on her neck. All his exercises these last few weeks, training. He draws it back until he hears a soft, satisfying crunch of cartilage. He's cracked her hyoid bone. And then, she's gone. That was the first chapter of the second book in the Two-Face series published on October 1st, 2018. At this point it was before the court case and around about five weeks before the release of the Discovery, a little bit more than that, about six weeks before the release of the Discovery. Going through the first chapter, um, one of the first aspects that I mentioned that was correct, but I, the way I imagined it and the way that it actually was were probably different, is the mention of the gloves, him adjusting his gloves. Now, in my mind, I imagined um, black gloves, maybe leather gloves, just in my mind. In hindsight, and given all the information we know now, I think it's more likely he used the blue nitrite gloves when he strangled Shanann. Now, those who believe that Shanann was killed in the bedroom and were killed, um, I guess, in the bed, the gloves make no sense and are completely irrelevant. And so we must then explain why there's a glove, a, a blue nitrite glove on the top of the refrigerator. And it appears to be another glove, but
below the bed in the bedroom. Now, we know that after the murder, wherever it happened, Watts went to the bedroom and he got a sheet and he used that sheet to transport Shanann's body. So that might explain what happened to the one glove. Um, and it's possible that when Watts threw away some of the bedding in the kitchen, that's what happened to the other glove. Um, we may um, we may be completely off track here on both versions. Watts may have put on on the gloves when he cleaned up the house on Monday night. So that's also a possibility. Be that as it may, um, in my imagining of this scenario, um, I did imagine that he would use gloves for, for, for many reasons. One reason was because he didn't leave any um, DNA um, on her body as far as we know because he didn't leave any strong bruises on her body and so something like a glove would mitigate to some extent the um, impact of fingers on skin. Again, I, d I didn't imagine a, um, a nitrate gl um, a nitrite glove. I didn't imagine a sort of a, a glove that basically is skin thin. I imagined a thicker kind of glove, and you know, oil workers do have th very thick gloves. So I kind of imagined a, a thicker glove that would have prevented him being injured and also. Um, sort of cushion the effort of strangling just in terms of his hands so so that's an aspect we still don't have certainty about but we do have certainty that gloves were found in the house and he could well have used those gloves during the murder or during the clean up or both we, we don't know we also don't know what those gloves tested positive for uh, certainly the one on the top of the fridge looks like it was just left there. Uh, it, it looks like possibly when Watts ran through the house, maybe he, there was a little bit of evidence lying around he needed to get rid of. The glove may have been one, and the glove in the bedroom may have been another. So um, these are still areas of some uncertainty. But, um, you know, I do try and, f try and um, imagine how this crime was executed using a kind of psychological reverse engineering. So one of the first issues was the fact that there were, were no sound. So nobody heard anyone screaming. They didn't hear children screaming. They didn't hear quarreling or conversation. They didn't hear um, shouting or, or, or a shriek in the middle of the night. So, so it was a silent death. Um, We don't know for a fact that when Shanann arrived that, that, that it was completely silent, but I, I do believe it was. I think he did need to hear where she was. It is possible that Watts may have left the television through the night and even through the execution of the crime so that that could kind of muffle whatever noise she made because a kind of stealth attack like this, if you get it even slightly wrong, if you don't cover the mouth and throat very quickly, then someone is going to shout out. And it is possible Shanann did shout out and no one heard it. Um, in my um, effort to figure out this aspect of the case, um, what I needed was the blueprints of the house. And this was ridiculously difficult to get hold of. It was very, very difficult to know how the house sort of fit together. We, we did know that this was a staircase. We did know... Um, there were various bedrooms, um, but there were no, at this point, there were no photos of the basement. We didn't know what was in the basement. We didn't know if there was a bed in the basement. We didn't know what the basement was used for. We knew that it was to some extent not furnished. So, so um, you know, could it have been used as a kill room? Could it have been used for something else? Um, The other aspect was the upstairs area, where were the bedrooms? And so one could look um, to some extent on the on the video Shanann herself had posted on Facebook of the interior of the house and get a kind of an idea. But if that sounds easy, if it sounds easy to just sort of look at Shanann's Facebook and 
kind of get a visual of the house uh, it wasn't because Shanann was usually in one room um, there were rare occasions where she walked while recording herself one of them was was that recording I think in April on a Saturday morning where she walked from the lounge through the kitchen to the outside door in the back garden but even then because she was sort of filming herself in like a rear view way um, it was still a little bit difficult to make out what was going on there um, so to get certainty on the on the inside of the house was incredibly hard and although there were other similar blueprints even those weren't quite right and they weren't quite the same you know a lot of these houses were built in on, on according to a certain model but the Watts house was slightly different so so that presented some difficulties um, it was also not immediately clear whether one could see through that those windows on the side of the doors we didn't have the body cam footage at that point and so it, it took a lot of study to, to check what the sort of transparency of the house was in terms of neighbors being able to look in and that also took a uh, heck of a long time it took a long time to get the because there was no blueprint of the house one had to rely on photos of the windows and photos of the doors and entrances and so on and um, but over time one did develop a little bit of a basic knowledge of it and then um, and then one needed to start um, using logic and intuition and the facts of the case to start juggling the various possibilities and um, obviously um, Watts's version in the warrantless ad arrest affidavit was something what one had to work from you had to look at that and say okay so according to him he was on the stairs when he heard something he said he couldn't quite make out what he was hearing and he then sort of in one version he ran back in another version he walked back but he went he went he went down the stairs while he was on the stairs he made like a u-turn and then he went back into the bedroom which presumably was Bella's bedroom so so according to his version CC was already dead presumably in her bed and then what's came from behind and found Shanann on top of Bella on top of the bed strangling her in this scenario you would need in, in just to prove Watts's version you would need DNA evidence of Shanann on Bella's bed and on Bella and theoretically that would be probable given that Shanann lived in the house but given the fact that she'd been away for as much as she had um, I think that 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 defense no longer really applies so it was for this reason that I suspected that Watts may have used something like Bella's pillowcase to strangle Shanann so that he would contaminate his own crime scene with Shanann's I'm not saying that he was necessarily trying to put the blame of murdering the children on Shanann not saying that I'm not saying it wasn't the case I'm just saying um, in his own version it was that that Shanann killed Bella on Bella's bed and so I thought maybe he wanted to um, when he committed the murder maybe he wanted to sort of contaminate the murder with with um, of of, of um, Shanann with Bella's DNA it's a bit of a long shot but it was just in my thinking there were other possibilities as well such as using a cloth or something but the idea of a pillowcase is one can use it as a sort of a lasso even kind of a garrote and a pillowcase can also be if one holds it open to some extent one can immediately sort of pull it over someone's face and, and thereby blinding them and also just you're not necessarily muffling them um, but but um, there may be a certain amount of you know that you, you would struggle to breathe and not be able to see in a situation like that there are many other ways one could do it also with a plastic bag or a 
or a, or a, um, a shirt or just a, a, a kind of a short a smallish sheet or blanket you could even have used the sheet um, in a situation like that in any event um, you know this was the scenario that I contrived in um, for the book that was published October 1st so the difficulty in a thing like this is you dealing with facts and fiction the facts are the facts that you are trying to sort of bring as absolute boundaries into your fiction so you know and that's the more facts there are the easier it is to write your scenario so you want as many as possible and sometimes you write and then you you realize well that actually doesn't make sense and then you you've got to change what you're saying um, sometimes m some more information comes out and then you see that that actually doesn't line up so um, I still think the the gloves are accurate I still think um, the fact that Shannon never screamed and there were no defensive wounds suggests he used some sort of murder weapon uh, besides his hands and um, given what he admits uh, again I don't know if I believe it but given what he admits about smothering the children to get to death using the same blanket um, one gets the sense that that may have been what he would have thought of using maybe on Shannon so um, so yeah so the scenario in October 1st was I'm still pretty happy with it w uh, um, now, although there, there, are a little, there are a couple of problems with it. Um, just going through it, um, we see that she kicks off her shoes and, and is walking bare feet. Um, I also do th think about that. Would Watts also have been bare feet? Um, the fact that they were on a carpet sort of made it irrelevant because whether he had shoes on or not, um, but one can also think that in a situation of murder the person wearing shoes would have added protection and it would also contain DNA as well um, I was obviously incorrect about the plastic wheels turning and rolling along the foyer floor um, one's got to be careful with fiction especially in true crime when I say fiction I mean a dramatized scenario that you can't be absolutely sure is true. You've got to be careful with it that one doesn't get too caught up in one's own mind and imaginings. It's easy to do because it's a dramatic um, event. You know, it's when someone kills someone else. It's a very dramatic event. Uh, there's a lot of emotions. People's juices are up. Um, there's a lot of adrenaline, and it's easy to get caught up in that adrenaline. So, yeah. So you know. I sort of imagined Watts being hyper vigilant and listening to every sound. He's in a situation where th it's, this is the, a critical moment. You know, he's premeditated it, he's planned it. The children are already dead, and now he's about to execute the toughest uh, crime of all, which is a 33-year-old man, um, fit and strong, and with advantage of catching her by surprise. But he's got to take on a 34-year-old woman who may be. Uh, weary and she may be pregnant she may even not be feeling very well but she's still you know a, an adult female capable of defending herself capable of fighting him off so he needs to make the first five seconds really count in order to pull this off if she screams out it can be over for, for him and his his whole um, uh, strategy so his first um, move needs to be to advance on her without her knowing from behind and then catching her basically around her mouth so she can't scream and so in my mind I sort of thought the most soundproof areas of the house and I'm sure he had to think about this as well is if I'm going to kill someone and I'm, it, it takes four or five minutes to strangle someone um, then I need to make sure she doesn't scream or, or if she does scream no one hears it for for three or four minutes and which is the most soundproof part of the house and so I thought um, there were certain areas that were more soundproof than others so for example the basement would be more soundproof the stairs of the basement would be more soundproof 
then you could say, well, would the garage be more soundproof? I don't think it would be, just because that door is close to the neighbor. You know, the garage door, the wooden door, is close to the neighbor, and it's also not a very thick um, material. It's thinner than brick wall. And so when I looked at the blueprints I had available, they still weren't the right ones, but when I looked at those that I had available, the interior core of the house which is the staircase seemed like the most soundproof area and it also seemed like the best um, way to trap someone who also knew the house well um, and what I mean is you know if he was going to pursue her as soon as she took a step onto the stairway then she had only one uh, one means of escape not out through the front door and not out through the kitchen door because he was behind her and there was kind of a gateway in terms of the balcony of the stairway her only escape route was up which was not an escape but it was certainly would give her a temporary escape from him and of course he's faster than she is and he's stronger than she is and he's been jogging so he knows he can outrun her up the stairs if that's what is going to happen in any event um, so not only is that area more soundproof it's also it, it sort of provides a narrow corridor in which she's trapped she can't go left or right she can only go forward and up and because she's pregnant she's, she's carrying her suitcase it's she's labored you know he's got all the advantages so these were all the things that I had to sort of figure out. So the part that wasn't correct was the, the flame orange suitcase. So obviously October 1st, I still wasn't um, in a position to update that information. And it looks like she was carrying the bag, but, but that does support the whole idea of her being easier to sort of restrain and get the advantage of because her arms were sort of um, her arms were preoccupied it's not really the right word but but her arms were caught up in that activity whereas his arms were free and he could get the first move on her he could get the jump on her in a, in, a, in any event so I described this very mel very melodramatically as you know each movement of those wheels of the suitcase turning and and what's being able to hear that and um, because in my mind I saw him as kind of being blind in the sense that he couldn't see while he was behind the pillar there was a period where he wouldn't be able to see her and that may have been a bit too dramatic I think you know once she was on the staircase he just needed to jump around and 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 that's all you know he, he, it was really a matter more of timing than of seeing or hearing um, so so that that's another aspect is I saw him crouching behind that central pillar and that is also quite difficult to get a good sense of from video of the inside of the house from Shanann's social media um, obviously once the body cam footage came out it was quite clear that there was the central pillar and that there was sort of a there wasn't a pot plant there was something that would prevent him from standing snug against that pillar and in a way it was a relief when the body cam footage came out because I I couldn't be sure that that pillar even existed and I couldn't be sure that um, there wasn't something there that would jut out and prevent him from sort of hiding behind it but um, yeah with enough research um, it did look like that was where he could have hidden and th that would have been a good place if he was going to attack her from behind once she sort of entered the house and, and went up the stairs now there were many people who were dismissive of this for many reasons um, probably most of them just have held to the belief that she was killed where he said in the bedroom and in the bed and I don't really want to go into that here but um, it's ridiculous in a premeditated murder um, for someone to kill 
someone else in their bed because then who else could the killer be? You know, if think about it like this: if someone ends up dead in your bed, who else could have murdered that person except you? Um, unless you can find a you know a broken window or broken door, but if that's not there, the first thing people are going to think of is you. You know, who else shared that bed? You know, so. Of course, you can say, well, no, it wasn't a premeditated murder, but then it, it, it's all that sort of argument. Um, there were other people who said, well, how the hell would Watts know that she would just go straight to bed? Uh, wouldn't she go into the kitchen? Wouldn't she go this way or that way? Um, I appreciate that argument, but I disagree with it just because most people know the habits of people that they live with and most people know when someone arrives late at night um, what they would tend to do and it's not to say Shanann wouldn't have gone into the kitchen um, and even if she had um, wouldn't necessarily have made much of a difference um, but you know t she came home at two o'clock in the morning almost and so the first thing she would have wanted to do is go to bed um, but then some people said, well, but her purse was in the kitchen. But that's not how it got to the kitchen. Her purse got to the kitchen apparently from her office. So one can say, did she go from the front door to her office? I don't think that happened either. Just think about the average situation. You come home from a business trip. You've eaten on the trip. You've done all that. What do you want to do most of all at 2 o'clock in the morning? You want to take a shower and go to sleep. You want to be in your bed. That's that's your number one priority. So, so anyway, that's how I saw it. A, l a lot of people <coughs> didn't see it that way. Um, but be it be that as it may, um, I did gravitate to the the staircase, and it did make sense that 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 would be um, his sort of plan of attack. Now, in terms of the last thing Shanann sees. Um, in my um, reimagining of it, she sees the carpeted suitcase really up close, very close to her face, and I've described it as rising up through the dark house. The far-off bump, uh, I'm not sure if I described that very well in the actual narrative, but the far-off bump refers to um, the suitcase sort of tumbling down the stairs. Um, and... And then the last thing that she sort of sees from that position of being prostrate on the stairs but looking sort of down, maybe one arm stretched ahead of her, but kind of in a fetal position with what's his weight on her and her head sort of turned back. Maybe she's blinded by a rag or something, maybe not. But if she's, she was able to see, maybe she saw the suitcase or maybe she saw the carpet. Um, one might say this is being too graphic and too sort of too detailed, but I think it is important in a reimagining to try and imagine what what are the exact grainy last moments of someone's life, and why why is it not not necessarily this? Why is it not necessarily that? And I know in the one documentary they they show sort of a hand hanging from. Um, from their bedroom so it's, a dra it's dramat uh, dramatized but you see sort of arm hanging over the head arm uh, hanging over the edge of, of the bed and that's in one of the documentaries and so that's the version of Shanann's last moments I don't believe that for a second um, so in the very last lines of that first chapter I also referred to what's being like a crafty fox um, he's, she's now she's passed and he's now sort of moving lightly around her sort of on the staircase and he um, maybe he's adjusting his grip around her neck uh, she might still have been alive at that point or just after but I was kind of just imagining him like almost like a spider moving over his prey and he's now um, really going in for the kill so she's he's managed to sort of um, squeeze the life out of her but now he must um, make sure that he's got his grip or whatever 
in any event, um, I was a little bit vague on this point, but it sort of ends with him cracking a hyoid bone. And we do know from the autopsy that, that there was bruising to that part of the throat and, and the hyoid bone is mentioned. So on that aspect, I think I was... Um, I'd like to say correct, but I'd prefer to say I was on the right track. Um, I don't think there was a crunch of cartilage, like I've mentioned, but what may have felt um, sort of fragile um, um, tissue under under his arms and under his um, hands. You must remember when when a person manually kills another person it is a very physical uh, mechanical process so that was kind of what I imagined I imagined it would be a sort of a physical encounter like that and um, I think the fact that he was as physically fit and strong as he was and that he trained and I think that gave him a psycho psychological advantage that he could pull off the actual attack uh, in the way that he could he eat become a faster runner, he'd become a stronger man and he'd become sort of more confident uh, with his game in certain ways. So that was really the, um, the scenario. Thanks for listening and if you'd like to purchase um, the second book, um, Two Face Beneath the Oil, as I said it was published October first uh, 2018 to run through some of the chapters uh In the second last and last chapter of the of the book, I do spend a bit more time um, going through the staircase execution again and and in more detail. So I basically introduce the the narrative and the idea in the beginning, and at the end I sort of finalized it. So so that that's really what that first. Um, the first um, narrative dealing with that particular aspect uh, covered, which is essentially in book two. Bear in mind that all these books are available on Kindle other than uh, Oblivion, which is available on paperback. Um, you don't need a Kindle to read a Kindle book. Uh, you just need to download the free app, but you will need an Amazon account. Thanks very much for listening and if you've got any questions or observations please uh, please leave one in a comment below and please like and subscribe to this channel. Thanks for listening.